All right, I think we have everyone here now so that we can uh, go ahead and um, open our work session this evening. And uh, Katie, I don't think we have any board and commission interviews, do we? No, Mayor. Okay. Is there anything on the regular agenda that we need to review? If not, we'll go immediately into the issue meeting updates. And um, let me see if I can do this in some sort of um, alphabetical order. Karen, Alexander. <laughs> oh, let's see. Well, we just had, um, sorry, okay. Library board. Well, they're basically the all of the the, the libraries in the municipal area. Oh, sorry, are actually closed. Um, we're open for curbside service only, and we intend to just continue that for a while. Uh, actually, there was some conversation about how well there, there was a survey that they did with the members of the. Um, of, of the library and the community. And they got really good positive feedback about the curbside service. But one of the things, and they talked about potentially keeping that, but one of the, Tom gave a reason uh, for advisement against that was that it actually minimizes the use of the facility. So it, it reduces the chance that people, they're concerned that it would reduce the chance that people would actually come into the library and utilize the facility. So that's that's not something that they can actually, that, that they, they think they wanna continue doing after the library. Um, I mean, after you know, everything goes back to normal, whatever normally is. And um, that's all that was pretty much going on. They did lose the groundskeeper that has been taken care of the, um, <laughs> library for 10 years, it was COVID related. And um, so they are actually putting to, uh, trying to uh, do sort of a, um, uh, in his honor to create uh, some funds for people to be able to uh, have reading materials and stuff having to do with gardening or what have you. Um, so that's, that's something that they were talking about. I'm probably not giving that justice, but that's about all that we had for the library. Thanks, Karen. Next A is Laura Arnold. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, both the Business Development Commission and the Sustainability Commission met over the last two weeks. Uh, to start with the BDC, we have the BDC has renewed its partnership with the Webster University of Video Production class to do two more videos highlighting businesses. It looks like for the spring, the themes will be gifts and then a second thing of spring planting. Um, so look for those. It's early in the semester, so I'd say a couple months really before we see them. But in reviewing the holiday programs, one of the things that Mara showed us was that in driving social media traffic, those videos were really valuable. So hopefully this can continue to be a partnership that we have for quite a while. The students seem to get a lot, a lot out of it and clearly our business community does as well. Um, the mayor visited after a discussion of the trade association in Old Webster about how we can better work together with our business community organizations uh, and a working group was formed to try and work on that a little bit. There are some members of the BDC and then recruiting someone from both Old Orchard and from Crossroads to participate in that. And, and we are tasked with coming back with some suggestions and getting a little better understanding of how we communicate with our business community more generally. Uh, and then Rebecca now announced that there are no Heart of the Community Awards this year. Instead, they're doing Creativity in Crisis Awards to recognize and highlight businesses and organizations that have ad adapted to the pandemic in creative ways to do their business and serve their clients. So if you have ideas about businesses, or organizations that could be recognized, you can go to the chamber website and find um, contact information there. Those nominations are due by March 12th and there will be a virtual celebration. 
Uh, in terms of sustainability, uh, Todd Reg has become our new sustainability liaison, which I think works really well, given some of the walkable, bikeable um, ideas that the commission wants to work with to see what from that 2014 plan is really feasible and Todd's the right person to work with the commission to try and sort through that. Um, in addition, they're looking at us rejoining the Green Cities Challenge. We did that and focused on Parks and Rec a couple of years ago. There's the opportunity to maybe focus on a different uh, department uh, and actually they were thinking about public work. So once again, Todd's the right fit for that particular initiative for them. Uh, and then Mara came to talk about what the planning commission is working, or the plan commission is working on, because it does have real implications for the interests of the sustainability commission. And I thought that was a really good conversation. And I think the members of the commission felt like that it was a really good crossover for them to be included and to understand the initiatives going on in front of the plan commission. So the degree to which we can do some of that, I realize that Mara only has so many hours of the day. Um, but cross collaboration of commissions, I think that's a great idea. Thanks, Mayor. Thanks, Laura. Uh, Pam Bliss. Hi. Um, Green Space Advisory Commission met last night and they have two events in the works. The first one is a winter tree ID walk at Larson Park, and that's going to be at the end of this month sometime. Um, it'll be open to the public, but um, limited to 15 people, socially distanced with masks. So that date's to be determined. And as soon as I hear something, I'll probably be able to tell you at the next council meeting, but they'll also be posting that on Greenskeepers, which is their typical volunteer website. Um, then the second event is Arbor Day, which is going to be April 27th at Blackburn Park. Um, the commission's going to be planting 200 trees earlier in the afternoon. And then at 5 p.m. will be the celebration. And that is something that we will all be invited to attend. And then last night also the plan commission met again to discuss the zoning code text amendments. Um, the first one is about two family residential. And the overall idea is that two family dwellings are gonna be, um, have the same basic requirements as a single family dwelling. Um, this is just in one A4 district right now. Um, and then the other topic that came up is that Central Webster and Marshall Avenue are historic districts. They have A4 zoning and they will need to also adhere to the historic district guidelines. Um, the second set of text amendments is for the residential dimensional requirements. And that's going to cover all of the residential districts um, the overall idea, and this is something that we've been talking about for a long time, is to protect the smaller scale homes and provide for diversity in type of housing and size of housing and, the, and keep the character of uh, housing buried in Webster um, and to also attract new families to Webster. Um, Mara and Danny presented a lot of data, which was very good and helpful. Um, they also accompanied it with good vis visualizations, which we usually don't see from them, but it was good for them to see drawings of houses and how different scenarios would um, relate to the new requirements. Um, another thing that came up with that dimensional requirements, which we talked a little bit more and further was um, the allowable square footage of half story um, homes or half stories on homes. Right now it's 75%. Um, we wanna get it back down to 50, uh, which is where we were prior to 2017. Um, and I was curious, maybe Mara can say that, tell us later, but I would kind of wanna know just so we can expect the timeline, um, what we thought is a realistic date. You think the plan commission will be done and it'll be coming to council. Um, that's so all. That's I, all. I know that we are, um, we held it to one more meeting to the March 1st, but I think they're getting really close on voting. Um, if they vote on it on March 1st, it should come to the city council April 6th. And then depending on the timing, um, it could be voted on as early as April 20th or May 4th. Thank you. All right. Is that it, Pam? 
Thank you. David Franklin? Nothing for me, Mayor. Okay. Um, uh, Sarah Richardson? No updates this week. Okay. Emerson Smith? No updates, Mayor. Okay. Uh, Neil, anything? In keeping with the trend, I have nothing. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let's see. Uh, uh, Joanne, do you have anything? Just one thing. So I think we, I mentioned before about not receiving the second half of the money from St. Louis County yet for the CARES funds. And just late yesterday, I received um, an email from them saying they needed a little bit more information. Oh boy. Um, that information actually has already been sent to them, but I'm resending it in a different format so it's easier for them to follow. But um, it's already been sent to them, so hopefully we should be receiving that money soon. And I know that other cities, such as Creepcore and others, have just received theirs. So mm -hmm. I think it's not too much longer until we get our second half. Right. Thanks, Joanne. Marie? I think I'm the other Joanne this evening. <laughs> so, uh, yes. <laughs> I didn't realize I had her name as well. Uh, most of my updates will come through the course of the other discussions, but I will just share continuing to meet with different uh, community members and stakeholders. Uh, and so that has been uh, greatly appreciated. If there's other individuals you all would like me to meet with that have not already come up in our discussions, please let me know and I'll do so. Right, great, thank you. And I have two, uh, two meetings that I want to report on. Um, First is the Police Community Engagement Board met uh, a week ago, and it was a really very good meeting. Um, the current chair, Kevin Sombart, felt that it was time for a new chair, and so a nominating committee has been formed, and the members of the PCEB will come forward with some recommendations for a new chair. Um, we discussed the uh, November 19th Alliance for Interracial Dignity meeting, talked about that at length. Many of those vignettes, uh, one of them was 25 years old, but it was pointed out that some of the feelings are still there. And so there was a good discussion around, um, around some of the emotion that came with those, those vignettes. Um, we talked about the Webster Rose Rotary Club meeting that was uh, that that the PCEB presented at, and that went way over time. People were really involved with that. It was a very good meeting, and we are working, or one of the members is working with Webster University, and there will be a meeting of the PCEB with Webster University students and faculty at some point in February. The police chief uh, provided us with uh, a number of body camera incidents, uh, observances of the behavior of officers um, and de-escalation uh, tactics. We talked about the latest PCEB survey that they've worked so hard on doing and trying to get that out. It's so hard with COVID now, um, being unable to go to all these meetings with the survey and we're working on, on getting that out. They had decided that it was not going to be of general um, interest to folks and they didn't want to put it out generally and now they do. So there are some things that we need to work with uh, with that. And finally, the police chief mentioned that there were a number of things that have happened since the PCEB has met and uh, there were a couple of policy changes that the police department has, has enacted. And I, I have, I wanna tell you what those are because we've been, maybe I've been the one who's been really lax in presenting those. Um, because of the discussion with the PCEB, the police department has eliminated three uh, automated license uh, plate readers from the patrol fleet. And you may remember that there was an incident involved with that and they are gone now. They have also reduced the uh, Interstate 44 traffic enforcement by 42% following discussions in that regard. They have discontinued the policy of affecting arrests on bench warrants for minor traffic offenses. 
all because of the discussion of that group. And finally, they have decided to focus and target hazardous moving violations only. So they're looking at things like speed and stop signs and whether people stop at signals and DWIs and that sort of thing. And they've, they've quit doing things like your license plate tab is missing. So a lot of that has come from the discussion with the PCEB and I wanted to let you know about that. And we will be more diligent about making reports. The Arts Commission met this morning and that group is is got more things going uh, that we want to relate to you. First of all, you know, Earth Rabbit has turned around now. And so go and take a look at it. Um, the group voted to collaborate with Webster Arts on a community art project uh, called Spring Forward, where people will get um, some plywood and, and do some art projects that will end up being displayed at Eden or along Lockwood or along the library. And the folks on that commission talked a little bit about how some families will not be able to afford the $25. And there were lots of donations that sprung from that group. So we're gonna be able to take care of folks who may not have $25 for that project uh, and work with Webster Arts in getting that done. Uh, we, we've had an offer from Walter Parks, who you may or may not know, Kath, uh, Kay Wenzine's uh, son-in-law. He's relocated here from New York. He has a huge, long, deep history in the music business, and um, he would like to do some, um, some concerts in Larson Park, and the, the uh, Arts Commission would like to co-sponsor those, and we need to talk to the Parks Department before we go anywhere with that. Uh, poetry Month traditionally is April and the Arts Commission has always done something for Poetry Month, but this year there's so much interest in poetry because of Amanda Gorman. And so there are a lot of good ideas that are surfacing about what we can do, including even having students read parts of Amanda Gorman's poem that she read at the inauguration, maybe on the steps of City Hall. There are lots of things surfacing with that. Uh, and finally, one of the big projects is a walking tour. Um, we have a lot of public art and we haven't cataloged it and we're going to, the, we've, we've just, they have just begun to figure out how we can do some walking tours with what's available. So lots of stuff going on. So those are my two committees, busy this, this, uh, this last week. All right, anything else? If not, we will continue to go on to our topics of the evening. And the first one is the allocation of potential use tax funds and a budget discussion. As you know, we're going to put the use tax on the ballot. And there was some suggestion that perhaps we have a good idea of where we would like those use tax funds to be used. Um, and so some of you, I know, have thought this through somewhat and um, maybe have a project or something that you feel might be a use for part of those funds, um, perhaps a better part of those funds going into the general fund for, you know, things like IT upkeep and uh, other sorts of things. So I, I'm going to open this up and see if anyone on council has a suggestion for those use tax funds, which I know Laura does. <laughs> So that's surprising, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, those of you who have, have been on council for a while may remember uh, a couple of years ago, I advocated that we essentially put sort of a surtax on building really big houses so that some of that would go to a housing related fund so that we could work on preserving some of the housing stock we have that is more accessible to people in our community. And, um, so I would like to see us designate some of this money for housing related activities. We have a housing plan that we really have not worked very far through. Um, and it could range from things like um, providing a utility tax rebate to uh, low income senior homeowners who really struggle paying their, paying their income tax. We can't give it back to them, the income tax, um, but we maybe can find other ways to ease that burden 
or to think about potentially um, expanding our home repair program for lower income families. You know, we do a little bit of that through the community development block grant, but we, we really could do more. Uh, and, and, and there are partnerships that we as a, as a city could do with the Shepherd Center or with Webster Rock Hill Ministries to focus on some of this housing related. I do understand and I absolutely agree that we can't send it all to housing. Uh, as much as maybe in my heart, I'd love to do that, but some of it has to go for general fund as well. But I would like us to consider dedicating a significant portion of it to housing. And I'm gonna add on to that because I'm, I, I think if we had some sort of commission task force group that could help with even picking up a home off of the courthouse steps and finding some ways of um, helping with home ownership. I'm. I, I think if we could, if we could foster some programs that would help people build equity in wealth in a home, it would be great. And maybe this could provide some seed money for, um, for us to be able to do some of that. So now the rest of the council needs to speak. Uh, do, we, do we have any type of idea what type of income that might be generated yeah, yes. Joanne, don't, don't you think, I think it's going to be much more than that, but go ahead, Joanne. So, yes, um, based on various estimates and projections that I had received from the state of Missouri Department of Revenue, I had projected for the use tax for it to be $250,000. But if we, once we get the streamlined sales tax in effect, I expect it to be much higher because then it won't be a self-reporting situation. It will just be a much easier situation that the Department of Revenue will be will have set up with the other states. Okay. I, I agree with Laura. Uh, I, I like to see a good chunk of those funds go back in for home repairs uh, for our community. I think that a uh, because we only have a limited dollar amount that we receive, I guess, from the county for that uh, program. And working with other uh, agencies here in our town, uh, we can make a positive uh, mark by using those for home repairs for the needy. So Emerson, I, I wanna be uh, clear because I did use that as a, an example. I'm not sure that we wanna write it too narrowly uh, because there may be other things that we identify or if we have a task force that identifies as, as that, but, uh, me, but yeah. Let me, yeah, let me, let me broaden it. I'd like to see a good chunk that go back into the community. <laughs> I agree well, with will we'll go back into the community. Well, I know, just but how? you know, just how, just how. yeah. Mayor, if I can, and I apologize, Councilmember Smith, for uh, cutting you off. It strikes me that we have many uh, folks watching that may not fully understand the use tax. So perhaps a couple sentences could be shared about what the use tax is uh, for those that aren't as familiar. Well, the use tax is a tax on out-of-state purchases. It is called a use tax because uh, it is the fact that people use something that they purchased from another state. And I'll give you an example. Um, and I'm going to move away from the homeowners, but I'm going to go to a business, perhaps a bank, for example, that might buy $100,000 worth of furnishings. If they buy those out of state on the internet, they don't pay local sales tax. And and so they avoid that on purchases like that. This then would capture a sales tax. And what it would do, it would level the playing field because it would say buying locally, you have no advantage buying on the internet. Let's try to help our local businesses by leveling that playing field. Does that help, Marie? Anybody else want to add to that? So, you know, you capture a little bit the homeowner who buys, you know, 
a couple of sweatshirts on 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 the internet may end up having to pay a little bit more money and that that will level the playing field for the sweatshirt um, sellers but it's those big purchases that um, really could add up and help us and again level the playing field and well just, and as a side yeah. note i'm sorry i was okay. Maybe just the t-shirts wouldn't you have to have the two thousand at least two thousand dollars in accessories <coughs> otherwise you don't have to pay tax on the t-shirts and such true pay i'm sorry we cut you off please i was going to say the same thing sweatshirts or no it has to equal two thousand dollars dollars yeah or more or more okay I am. Uh, I I think that Laura's idea is a bit fantastic idea. I'm a, my 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 question is, I take it that we will set up some kind of committee in order to determine the parameters of how the money is spent. So it's just a global idea right now, and then we'll work through the process of how the money will actually be spent. Right, and I think though it might be useful for us. Um, to put a, a sum on there so that when we go out to the voters, they have some, some idea. Um, we don't have to put that in our ballot language or advertise it as a certainty because then that would be really difficult to change if we wanted to increase it. Mm -hmm. But I would kind of recommend that we say we're going to take $100,000 and put it into a fund for housing and homes. I, so would that I then mean, limit it to $100,000? Because at the moment, as we were saying us, that we could always increase it, but it would at least give us a start and would provide some surety of numbers. I absolutely like this idea, but I just want to make sure are we have we vetted other ideas and are, are we sure that there aren't other possibilities um, that could have similar benefit? Pam, than, go for it. Yeah, I, that's why we're here I don't, tonight. I don't know. I mean, we'd have to look at our goals, maybe, or some of our, you know, our vision statement or anything um, to see what we can apply it to. Just a thought. <laughs> well, if if we take a certain sum and put it into this housing fund, the rest of it goes into the general fund. And that then gives us leeway to use it for things that may change from year to year or yeah, that end up in the budget. That, I mean, it can't be education. Education would be a great thing, but it can't be education. But I'm trying to think of what other you know, healthcare, public safety, something that would help the community and those that might need it. So the, the only question I have for city staff is, obviously this is a wonderful wish, I think of councils, but I think that we do have to look at what our budget is and where uh, income and, and um, tax money is already being spent. And if there is any shortfall anywhere, that these normal taxes would normally go into, just so we are fully aware of, are we taking away from other services um, that this tax money would normally go to? And Joanne, maybe you could. Actually, I have a presentation to share with you tonight regarding the budget. So um, I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about that. And I think I can answer some questions and I can also present for you. I don't have the numbers, the projections for the upcoming budget quite yet. And the reason I don't have that yet is because we just now in February start putting the budget document together. And so I can have those numbers sooner, but I'd at least like to share with you where we are um, and where I foresee us being potentially in the, in the new year. So if you have a few minutes, I'll just go through some slides quickly. And then I believe um, Dr. Peoples has a few things she'd like to share with you as well. So I'm going to share my screen. So I do, Joanne. I don't want to cut off Councilman Franklin's discussion too quickly, though. Did you have other, other comments along those lines before uh, Joanne shares her presentation? No, I just am interested. All I want to do, like, obviously, I think this is a fantastic idea, and there's no doubt. And I, and I really liked Laura's idea uh, a few years ago regarding adding an additional surplus on big houses or additional tax on big houses. And I wonder if, 
I just want to make sure that that's not the better alternative rather than taking the money from the use tax revenue mm -hmm. if we have other expenses or other things that need to be satisfied or met uh, in order to continue this level of services that we currently have. Thank you. Before we move on to that, can I respond to David, one of David's earlier comments, which was, you know, how do you decide which programs? Is this a global idea right now? And what specifically? Um, you know, the good, the nice thing about this is we don't have to invent any of this. This is all, all these programs exist other places. We have some people help us pick and choose which is most adaptable to our community. And for me, that's a task force with a very specific deadline so that we get that from them quickly and, and we're not spending a whole lot of time trying to reinvent something that's been invented in other communities for years. All right, let's go with our budget uh, presentation so we can move along here tonight. Go ahead, Joanne. Can you see my screen okay? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is um, information for the upcoming fiscal year, which will be July 1st, 2021 to June 30, 2022. And as I just mentioned, the information that I share is actually from the current year and some information about prior years so that we kind of have an idea. And of course, um, I'm going to try to address things in a way um, so that we kind of have a, we can share our thoughts and our, um, information so that we have a better idea of where we are for the upcoming year. And I do apologize, David, I did not mean to interrupt you if I did cut you off. So tonight I'm just going to talk about the general fund since it, since it is the main operating fund for the city of Webster Groves. And I wanted to just give you a first visual of the budgets, 2020 budget, and then you can see um, how much money we had expected to receive. The second one then is what we actually did receive. And then the third one is what we're, um, what we budgeted for this current year that we're in right now. What I wanted to point out to you is we really um, did come in short on the revenue side, but it was poor, uh, areas that were unexpected to me, for example, as I was projecting them. So for example, on the sales tax, I was expecting us to fall a lot shorter on the sales tax. I thought for 2020, we were going to be bringing in only 80% of our budget. We actually brought in 92%. In 2021 on the sales tax, we're still um, doing well. And I'll show you that on the next slide as far as the actuals, uh, the comparative numbers for um, mid-year. The utility tax is what I did not expect. I did not think long term that people would be working from home, et cetera, et cetera. So those numbers for the actual are much lower than what we had in prior budget years. Normally, uh, some of our utility taxes are higher than what I project, um, the mix between electric and gas and so on and so forth. So this was another uh, shocker. And so even for um, 2021, that number is going to be lower as I present to you than the 2022 numbers. Um, finally, down low, uh, the recreation fees, we had no expectation or no belief that the recreation complex was going to be closed for such a long period of time, or that the services were going to be diminished as much as they were. So you can see, um, and I don't know if you can see my little arrow here, um, but for 2020 actual, we only received 1,386,000 of the one point, almost $2 million that we budgeted. And of course, um, we were doing fine for a while. And then of course, by the end of the year or closer to the end of the year, we had to refund because we weren't able to fulfill um, the services that people had prepaid for. The good thing is even though um, we ended up in, in a bad position that when the proposed budget was submitted to you for 2021, the number in total was off only by $100,000. So what I mean by that is the proposed budget said that we would be short $982,000 and um, from the 2020 CAFR, we were short $882,000. Still, it's not a good number, but I'm glad that we were as close as we were by being off by 100,000 because who knows with the pandemic what we really 
where it really could have been, you know? So this, you saw this previously, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but again, um, sales tax is in good shape right now. Utility tax is not so much. And, um, and the other income for 2021, we're not going to see uh, it anywhere close to where it was for 2020 or 20, probably not even 2019, uh, because the interest rates are just ridiculously low. Joanne? Yes. I ask a quick question about this slide on the fines. Can you explain? I mean, I think I understand why it's going down, but maybe for those that are listening, the uh, explanation for why it's such a huge decrease in 2021. Yes. So for um, 2021, there the enforcement is not as much by the police department as it has, in, has been in the past. So um, they're doing basically essential things that they're required to do, but it's not the extensive enforcement that we had done in the past. And in addition, um, it's not just that, but probably predominantly is because our municipal court is only operating virtually and has for several months, it was completely shut down. And so to do it virtually is challenging because it requires us, the court clerks, to contact individuals and make sure they can set up for virtual court. And if you don't have a cell phone or a laptop or a computer or any type of technology, you really can't do that. So there are tr tremendous challenges to that. And thank you for the question. Um, okay, so then the next slide, this is just a, this slide is always almost the same, this pie chart. Our sales taxes are about the same. So sales tax is usually always uh, around 27%. And it is of course the highest um, revenue source for the city which is followed then by utility taxes, which of course is not as high this year. And then recreation fees is nowhere close to 13% this year. Again, I just wanted to quickly go through this and see if there are any questions. These numbers are higher generally because of the salary increases. Um, there were a lot of cuts that I'll talk about in a few minutes that were made to the fiscal year 2021 budget because of COVID and, um, and because certain things weren't even open um, or available. So for example, some of the conference items were cut. We still had training that some individuals could have participated in, but we were really worried and concerned that we wanted to reduce the budget. And so a lot of things that potentially we could have done, we did not even uh, partake in. This is the mid-year comparison that you've already seen. Again, as you know, Parks and Recreation is the one that's suffering um, or that hasn't been able to provide the services. Typically, there are a number of programs that they're offering. And so, of course, these expense items are a lot higher. But for 2021, they're not able to offer them. Many of them, they've had to um, refund uh, for the services if they hadn't participated or if part of the program um, the individuals participated then they just refund the remaining portion and just so you know um, when we do the budgets um, specifically on the uh, personnel the salary and benefits and all of that we budget as if individuals are here for the whole year and we don't consider if there are any terminations or anything like that. But that's why sometimes you'll see differences between like up here, um, the budget and the estimated are sometimes lower because of that factor. You know, there are differences generally because of personnel and other items and other benefits. And then again, this is the way generally um, police is the highest because they have the highest number of personnel and followed by fire at 24%. This again is typical for a municipality and specifically where, for Webster Grove is where the personnel services are three quarters of this, the general fund budget. And then finally, I just wanted to show you, these are the items, the individual cuts that we made. And this was 
Um, I'm sh you may not recall this. This was presented last year at our special budget meeting. These were a number of items that we had removed from the original proposed budget um, and discuss them to, to remove them from the final budget that you had voted to approve as the adopted budget. So there's just a number of items in here. Um, and it includes a number of things, including um, network ma management, software maintenance, um, boards and commissions items, um, and um, other things like police overtime and um, the different training items where we could remove it because we had other options. We never did a situation where we removed police and fire training where they, they were required items. So the police training was still, they still were able to get the training that they're required to get each year. And then finally, this is just a line, um, a line graph of what the expenses were for the last five years. And then this final slide that I wanted to share you share with you are the um, where the fund balance I believe is. So it should be increased by uh, the fund balances of June first, twenty twenty, which is the audited amount that we received from our CAFR, or that was displayed in our CAFR was eleven million dollars, and then plus the revenues minus is, minus the expenditures, and then the transfers in, which include the one. 0.5 million from the St. Louis County CARES Act, um, the St. Louis County Municipal Relief Program, uh, brings us to a fund balance at the end of 2021 of 11,783,000. So that is all of the information I have at this point. Thank you, Joanne. And then on the last slide, uh, just new items for consideration that I believe capture some of the discussions that council has had. Uh, but as we discuss how to move forward with diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, determining what that line item amount is and how that will be sustained within the budgets. Because as you all know, that's the DEI work is not a one and done. There's ongoing training and costs associated with it. Uh, boards and commissions, I've been doing some digging around. Uh, thank you to uh, Joanne and others for their assistance with that. But the, the budget item in question with that is that not all the boards and commissions have budget lines, which perhaps may not be necessary necessary, but they seem to be funded uh, very differently. And there's been several questions about that. So that might be a point of interest for council as well as you're determining budget. Uh, as I sh have shared with you all uh, individually, I'm going to be bringing forth in this evening during our closed session some technology and cybersecurity improvement needs, and there certainly will be some costs associated with that as well. And then, of course, there was the use tax uh, discussion and uh, Councilman Franklin, you, you mentioned on one of Joanne's slides the, uh, the fees associated with law enforcement and uh, the courts and how they have decreased significantly. And of course, some of that will pick up as uh, Ms. Jadali explained with courts opening back up. But that also gets to what Mayor Welch shared from the uh, PECB committee meeting. And that, you know, police and Chief Court Curtis could certainly speak to this more if there were questions, but they're doing enforcement, particularly traffic enforcement differently, uh, which impacts revenues. And so that's great for community relations and I believe is the, the direction and what we wanna put forth um, in terms of uh, mission, vision and values, but it does hit the bottom line. And so those are numbers that are not going to be going back up. So as we look at revenue replacement rather than traffic enforcement, that's also an area of consideration. Uh, Joanna Zimmerson, I have one question. Did I see a slide that compared the 20, 21 budget to where we are with the uh, expenses? Sorry, I didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> Sorry about that, Emerson. Um, so this is the departmental expenditures that compare the last year's budget with the current year's budget. Is that what you're asking me? Yes, I think so, yes. Okay. Okay. I got you. All right, can you, can you provide us, a, at least provide me with a copy of those uh, slides? Yes, they will, um, I'll ask Katie to distribute them to everyone after this. I apologize, I didn't get them done sooner. So that's why you don't have them at your, in hand right now. That's right, thank you. You're welcome. So 
going back to our initial conversation, um, it sounds to me, Marie, that these things that you're talking about here are important considerations for use tax funds. And so before we jump into making a commitment for where they go, we should be talking about some of these items, correct? That would be my recommendation, Mayor Walsh. Yes, okay. So, Can I ask a question? yes. Um, just knowing that technology is kind of a broad term, I'm curious if, if part of what we're considering is um, continuing the accessibility that's been established for our meetings with COVID um, and the ability for folks to, to participate from home and um, in both Board of Commission and Council meetings. And if there's a way um, for us to kind of incorporate that going forward as well, because I know there's some challenges there. Absolutely. That is definitely a part of the discussion and there's some uh, already some cost around that, of course, that have been found and researched. And, and that actually is the easier cost pieces of the discussion. Okay, thank you. All right, so what this comes back to is for us, I think to probably continue this discussion of how we use the use tax funds that we can make a statement that we want to use some portion of it for housing, but until we get more information, we can't really come up with some specified amount. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay, that's what I'm hearing. I have no problem allocating a certain amount. I just, I just, I appreciate Joanne's uh, um, presentation here. I, I think my concern is I just want to make sure that we are being uh, good stewards of the taxpayer funds um, and ensuring that it is used in the most wise and efficient manner um, for the current needs, especially in, in light of COVID and everything like that. So, I mean, I'd be happy to say let's allocate X number of dollars towards housing because I think it's extremely important for what we want to accomplish in this city and what we need to accomplish. But I also just want us to take into consideration everything else that uh, that the city does as well. So we might make a we we might begin by making a statement that we're in support of allocating some funding toward housing and homes, um, but we can't come up with a specific amount at this point. Correct. Uh, okay. I, I'm fine with that. I, I will just say um, I look forward to getting some firm understanding of what the other things might need in terms of the amount of resources as well, uh, because I, I do think it's important that we do more than just generally say as a concept, we think that housing is important for some mm -hmm. money. Okay, so let's hang on to that for um, our next meeting after we go through some things that we need to consider uh, in light of what um, Marie has brought out. All right, let's go to our next agenda item, uh, which is the Public Affairs and Engagement Director. And uh, I'm going to send that off to you, Marie, because this is your proposal. Excellent. Thank you so much. And so um, just following up on the, the budget discussion and the use tax, uh, I will continue working with staff to try to put some hard numbers around that. Some of that, though, is the philosophy around the DEI and how much we want to expend. And so I'll need direction from council on, on those sorts of things. Um, and But happy to do the legwork and research there as well. Uh, regarding the public affairs and engagement director, I am pleased to be able to have this discussion with you. And I've exchanged emails uh, with many of you. I've already answered some questions, but I am open to the discussion so that we can have it. Um, what I will share about this is that, of course, it is a new position and it's hard to wrap your arms around everything that a new position would do, particularly when there has not been any public affairs or uh, direct engagement position uh, that, as far as I can tell, in the history of the city. And so what I'm really looking for is someone with both breadth and depth of experience and knowledge that's going to be able to do the marketing pieces that we've talked about, much of the social media information. Um, we've got a good Facebook presence, but we are, we've got to, and I say got to, because I think it's really important that we are a, a city hall for all city members. 
and so that we reach people in a variety of formats and through a variety of media. Um, another you know, area that this person would be engaged in is the legislative affairs. And so just a sample of that is some of the federal updates that I've shared. And by legislative affairs, that doesn't mean, you know, taking place of counsel or testifying on behalf of, although you may want that at some point um, as, you know, there's different circumstances that arise. But really doing the research piece and bring, being able to share with you some of the federal initiatives and perhaps funding opportunities as well that would benefit the city or perhaps our, our partners as well um, in terms of what they could apply for, or perhaps what we could assist them with. So really looking at a well-rounded position uh, that really requires a high degree of business acumen, um, political savvy, as well as those all around communication skills to be able to put forward materials uh, that reflect what uh, council uh, needs and you know the, the needs of programs, as well as bringing back that information exchange from community members to help us understand what the community would like to see. And there's a couple of initiatives that I could think of. I mean, the use tax would be a great one. I know the mayor has been busy working on a lot of the information and has enlisted some of the staff. And uh, you know, in many ways, this should be something uh, mayor that staff is handing off to you for approval rather than you doing it. <laughs> so. <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the use tax, um, redevelopment, wherever that may go, that this person would help uh, do some of that. So I will stop yammering about, but hopefully you all have had an opportunity to look at the position description. The last thing I will share on that is the position description is a combination of many descriptions um, across the nation for both public affairs and community engagement, but more importantly, it is also encompassing of many local descriptions. Uh, this work is not new. Uh, Ms. Jadali, as well as some of her staff have been working on this position for a long time, even before my arrival. And so they already had research put together. And so we were able to cobble it together. And that's what you see in that uh, description is really a, a combination of many things that I think reflect of what local needs are as well. So I open this up for, again, council comment and discussion. 110% in favor. <laughs> so am I. I think we've talked about it before. I, I think it'll be a good addition to uh, the management staff at the council, I mean, at the uh, city hall. Great. I agree. I think, you know, there's some consultants that we would no longer need for this by having this person in house. And I think there's a definite benefit by having um, a communications person in-house um, just to learn and have kind of a historic knowledge of what's going on. Great. I would also uh, be 100% in favor. I, I think, you know, we have some staff who have worked really hard to try and fill in some of this, um, but they do that in addition to a whole other laundry list of things on their plate. And so, I think it would be great to have someone who is, this is what they do for us. Right, and I, I totally agree as well with having someone in-house. And I think someone just said that we have used consultants for many parts of this. And, but to have someone in-house, we have someone devoted and focused on our needs and able to see you know, what we need to project as a, as a city and, to just work on our behalf. And I have, you know, you guys know me, you know, I've advocated for this for ever. Um, and I, I, think, I think it's a really good position uh, that we need someone in that position. And I see it also that we, we need someone internally. You know, most of our work with our residents comes from letters, for example, that we send out because they violated something or, or some sort of um, interaction that they have in City Hall. And it would be nice to have somebody review that, look at that, think about our signage, how we present ourselves in terms of signage, all of those kinds of things I've thought for a long time we needed. So someone else to write the Friday page. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, and do the, do the next tax piece. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think you'll be on board before then, but we'll, uh, we'll try to get you some help. <laughs> no, we'll get this one done in 
the next one. All right, anything else? So any action needed on our, it's just a thumbs up it's, for her to get it's, started? It's on the agenda, uh, oh. Emerson. There's a resolution on the agenda that we will vote on later this evening. It, Great. Is, Great. it is there, okay? Um, it's Thank resolution, um, I think it's 2021. We'll take a look at it, so. All right, we have a few minutes left for appointments to boards and commissions, and we have um, quite a few folks here who have applied for these various boards and commissions. Uh, and at some point, let's talk about this policy of, um, we'll talk about that policy later on at some point, because I, I think we're all worried that we're offending people. And we have to find a way to make this happen without, without offense. So we have the Arts Commission first, and we have um, Marilyn Bradley has reapplied, CC Bartels has applied, she's also interested in parks and recreation. Katie Cahoon, who is the current chair, has reapplied. Um, Alex uh, Elmstad, who's been here a very short period of time, but he's interested in historic preservation, and Rob Longstreet. And I'm, I'm open to hearing your recommendations. I think big picture, I don't know why would this not be a good time to discuss ways to acknowledge, you know, those longstanding commission members, but also be open to um, the experience of, of the other members in our community um, and see how they can contribute. And we, we certainly should have that discussion again. Um, so, I mean, do you all, I mean, is it possible that we could come to some resolution about the overall policy before we, um, determine this? I mean, I think some people, I know, for example, CC has applied twice to the Arts Commission. This is her second time. Um, and then conversely, we have Marilyn, who's a founding member who's been on forever. So I think there's, it would be good in my eyes if we could come to some kind of resolution or compromise on how we're gonna uh, implement this policy in, you know, a, as fair or in a humane way as possible without waiting two more years for um, this more kind of conflicted appointment process occurs. Pam, I agree. I think that the, the current uh, policy that we have in place, I think is good is so long as it's implemented. Um, and I, I'm not saying that this is easy, nor do I want to hurt anyone's feelings, but I think that our thought process and why we enacted it was valid. And I still think it's valid. Um, I think the idea of bringing on new people, and that does, again, that does not discount any of the service that those that came before them did or and will continue to do for this city. It should be applauded and uh, commemorated. But I don't think that us just continuing to go around in the same wheel is going to be what we as council, I feel like enacted that that policy to effectuate, you know, to like to what we wanted. And if we have the policy, I think let's use it. Um, and, and we can figure out a good way of ensuring that the least amount of feelings or um, hard hard feelings are are not there. I don't know. You know, I'm not saying that this is easy, but I it's just not easy. I, it's, you not, know, it's not easy because we've had a long standing policy of if people have done a good job, they're needed on a commission. You know, you've been on the ARB, but you've, you've been through two terms, but you know, someone finds you valuable that we have just sort of um, kept them un unless we've had a, a huge interest. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to the good back thing. off of this a little bit because I, um, I'm just going to back off of it a little bit. I'm going to let you all talk about this. I mean, we're I lucky to have so many great resources here, right? I mean, this that that we should, you know, when people step up to say they they want to help, I, I mean, it's there's only so many times we can tell people no, we're going to go with people we already have before we lose them to something else. And we've turned away some great 
folks in the past, um, just anecdotally, I know of. And so, um, I mean, I think, yes, these these people are wonderful that have been serving a long time, but I think it's nice to let other wonderful people have a chance also. Can we come up maybe with a fellows program or um, some sort of emeritus where we recognize um, those members that want to stick with it and maybe they could be active somehow, but they are not, uh, yeah, just some kind of active membership, but allows new people to come on and be voting members. Uh, I, so I just to tack on here, follow what Pam says. I think, you know, frankly, the Arts Commission is our biggest That's challenge. The issue. And, but, but one, but it's also an opportunity maybe to think about the Arts Commission a little differently because it's not like the plan commission where we're legally required to have them vote on things. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, not like ARB where they're making specific design suggestions for, well, suggestions is the wrong word. It's more of a all hands on deck, let's work this out. So is there a way to use something like a fellows program or an emeritus program to let people participate? Maybe you're not a voting member anymore and that gives us a few new people in the mix, um, but it recognizes your long-term service. It makes sure you get the invitation to the meetings and get the agenda and the materials um, without, uh, you know, violating any of the, the real rules that we have to have for some of the other commissions. And it's also possible to extend the number of members of the, of the commission too, because you're right, it is, it's the arts commission. Um, well, and again, it's about the ideas and the implementation more than it is about the legal requirements of that commission. So I think it gives us more flexibility in how we think of that commission. I would prefer personally to do some sort of additional status rather than add more voting members. Um, just because, I don't know, my experience is when you get too many voting members, then things mm -hmm. get unwieldy. We've had pretty, we've had competitive selections for library board, um, green space. So I'm, you know, I think only because of the timing that it's an arts commission, um, important right now. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have the data and I, it would take Katie, I think a while to figure it out. I think it's the members who go for repeated terms, term after term after term has been an arts commission. You know, com when lots of people apply, we have to make a choice no matter what. It's, it's weighing new applicants versus returning that seems to have been um, the real challenge of the arts commission. So well, let's... Yeah. Because we need to continue on to the uh, our major meeting, let's come back and 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 get some data from Katie because there has been a, a bit of turnover in the Arts Commission over the years. There's been a lot of turnover, um, but not with a few few specific folks. And so let's think this through. But in the meantime, before we go to our meg regular meeting, there are some other people that that if we could please try to perhaps appoint, um, John Burst, Burst would like to be appointed or we interviewed him for the Board of Adjustment. Can we appoint him? Yes. Yes, anybody? Okay. Michael Rose uh, would like to be on the Historic Preservation Commission and we interviewed him. Can we do that? Um, and, uh, Bart B.J. Pupolo has indicated that he'd like to move from the alternate to the regular member of the Board of Adjustment. Is that agreeable with you? Yes. Yes. And finally, Patrick Murphy, who served just one term on, on the Arts Commission Board, can we reappoint him for a second term? Yes. Okay. We'll come back and have some more discussion about what we can do to make this thing work for the Arts Commission, but in the meantime, we'll have all those others. All right. Mayor, could I get some guidance on the data I'm supposed to provide? Is it turnover just for the Arts Commission? It's the Arts Commission. That's the only one at this point that we okay. need to figure out. The turnover that we've had, um, length of time, that sort of thing. And that we should be so lucky to have such an active group. Um, that does they've done they've done quite a bit for us in the community and so we have to figure out how to do this without offending anybody thank you all right then let's adjourn our um
work session and we're going to have to move to our regular session. Okay. Anyone need a two minute break? Then let's go ahead and go. Um, we're going to call this uh, regular city council meeting to order this evening. Uh, we welcome those of you who are out there on Zoom. We have quite a few participants this evening. Um, and if you want your comments to be read into the um, record for this evening, you need to submit them by four o'clock on the day of the meeting, which means by four o'clock today uh, to be included. And if you'd like to speak this evening, you can use the raise your hand button on Zoom if you would like to speak. Um, and you will need to provide your name when you do that. All right, let's start with the roll call. Mayor Welsh? Here. Council Member Arnold? Here. Council Member Bliss? Here. Council Member Franklin? Here. Council Member Smith? Here. Council Member Alexander? Council Member Alexander? She might have stepped away to go to the bathroom. Yeah. Council Member Richardson? Here. All right, I think we have everyone. When Karen comes back, we'll, we'll acknowledge her for, for being here this evening. Yes. Um, I wanna start out before we have remarks of visitors and say something, because we have 63 people on here this evening and that's a lot. And I want them to understand a little bit about remarks of visitors. Um, you know, the council provides time at every single council meeting that we have for remarks of visitors, but that's not the only way to reach us. We all welcome your phone calls and your emails. You can send an email to city council at webstergroves.org or to the mayor at webstergroves.org, or you can call us. We're all available. You can reach us in ways other than just remarks of visitors. We have a habit, we do not comment on the remarks because we do not get into debates with citizens who choose to come forward, make a statement about an issue. Those issues, suggestions that we take the issues and suggestions to heart, frequently we move these to the appropriate staff so that some action occurs on perhaps an issue that someone has. Now, what I want to say is that not all the statements that come from remarks of visitors are accurate. They may contain one or a few or many incorrect facts. And that is the case this evening with one of the remarks that refers to statements about the sales taxes in Webster Groves nationally and in the state of Missouri. And rather than correcting these remarks, that have inaccurate facts, we're going to ask you, urge the citizens who are here this evening to um, look at the educational materials that we're going to be providing concerning the use tax in the next weeks ahead. So we'll begin tonight with remarks of visitors and Katie, is, is it Jennifer that will be reading those this evening? Yes. And how many do we have? Um. About 15. About 15. With and some duplicates. 15. Yes, plus. All right. Our first one is from Dave Buck. It was received on the first. Uh, to our mayor, city council, and city staff, while we nationally celebrate Black History Month this February, the present and future opportunity to achieve real, meaningful diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice in Webster Groves remains a major city goal. Like most communities, Webster faces multiple challenges in this area, but I think the 20 year existence in the Webster Grove School District of the academic achievement gap between the performance of white and black students is by far our city's single greatest racial inequity and social injustice. Even a very conservative estimate suggests that at least 1,840 or more black students have been impacted over the past 20 years. Education scholars say that this gap tends to continue later in life in the form of an employment gap, income gap, and housing gap, etc. Importantly, they believe that the academic achievement gap begins at the start of kindergarten. Why? Because kids from lower income families cannot afford the tuition that every preschool 
or early childhood program in Webster Gross charges from the higher fees of Walter Ambrose, Goddard and Montessori to the even less expensive fees of church preschools and statesman free school. The result is that these kids start kindergarten two years behind their more affluent white peers in academic, emotional, social, and physical development. And thus the gap begins and so and does not measurably close during K through 12. Three possible solutions to this problem are, number one, the Webster Grove School District creates, includes, and test markets a universal preschool as part of Gibbons Elementary School in North Webster. Two, several church preschools, such as Emmanuel Episcopal, Webster Hills Methodist, and Webster Presbyterian join together to collaborate and find a creative way to welcome and include these kids into their programs. And three, Webster Rock Hill Ministries expands its after-school tutoring program to include free preschool for the kids of the needy in our community. In short, this is, huge, this is a huge persistent problem that has literally impacted thousands of black kids over the last 20 years. It is time we work together as one community to solve the problem once and for all and bring equity and justice to these kids' lives and their families. Peace, Dave. Uh, number two is from Daniel Brazzini. It was received on February 2nd. Webster Grow's 9.24% sale, sales tax is the fourth highest in the nation. Instead of helping local merchants, Webster Grow's sky high sales tax creates a strong incentive for residents to shop online from the 27 states without a use internet sales tax. April's proposal for an even, even higher sales tax to level the playing field by adding a use internet sales tax will certainly level our local businesses into insolvency from the loss of out of state sales and for having to pay $924 additional dollars for every $10,000 of purchases. Any tax on business is a tax on us, the consumer, who will pay more for the same goods and services. Higher prices mean fewer sales or no sales as cost conscious consumers and businesses always find a way to save money from cheaper no tax states. April's proposed use internet sales tax hike during these tough COVID-19 economic times is actually a toxic tariff akin to the Smoot-Hawley tariff during the Great Depression. Instead of protecting and promoting local businesses, this tariff resulted in higher prices and fewer sales that bankrupted businesses, deepening and extending the Great Depression. The proposed use internet sales tax hike is a business killing tariff, increasing the cost on businesses and consumers alike. With a municipal budget of $31.4 million, does the city of Webster Groves truly need the 250,000 expected from this 13th special tax more than our local businesses? Do our local businesses and residents understand that local on the internet age means everywhere? Why tax away our neighborhood businesses competitive advantage in this new local marketplace? Just look at your own shopping habits and compare how much you buy online versus how much you buy in a store. Imagine paying 9.24% on everything you bought online and for every thousand dollars you buy, you would be taxed $92.4. Ouch. What else could you buy and whose business could you support with you more money in your pocket? No municipality spends your money as wisely as you spend your own. No municipality has ever taxed its residents into prosperity. The city of Webster grows with its property tax, library tax, education tax, and 12 special sales taxes would be wise not to add an unlucky 13th. Remember, Webster Groves is a great place to live, work, and raise a family, not for a municipality to tax and tariff. Dan. All right. Our next one is from Lindy Carroll and was received on January 28th. I would like to address a few points against allowing golf carts on the streets of Webster Groves. My points address the golf cart environmental impact or lack thereof, social activities with neighbors, safety, and parking. I am not seeing the environmental benefits of using golf carts. The construction of golf carts uses resources and materials. Also used are fossil fuels to construct and deliver the carts. Sure, they would use less fuel, but golf carts don't have any emission controls like catalytic converters or EVAP canisters like cars do. If we are worried about the environment, we should consume less, recycle everything, stop using fertilizer on our lawns, buy smaller houses, walk, ride our bikes, or drive hybrid vehicles, among other things. Carts are minimally and typically used when the weather is nice. Unless you are using them for a long commute every day, there doesn't look to be a benefit for the environment. I don't see how owning a golf cart would enhance social activities. As an alternative to the golf cart, you could walk to a neighbor's house with a wagon loaded with a couple of chairs and maybe a cooler and a wiffle ball kit instead of uh, driving a golf cart. Never have I sat at home thinking that if only I had a golf cart, could I go and be social with my friends or neighbors? I just walk or drive. If a family wanted to go to a store or restaurant, they could simply walk, ride bikes, or drive. The lack of a golf cart isn't an obstacle and hasn't stopped me from doing any of these things. Another thing a family could do 
in the business districts is park at one end of the street and use the sidewalk to stroll past and go in and out of the restaurants, ice cream stores and shops, then walk back to the car. Webster has a few good areas where there are plenty of shops and plenty of room to walk down the sidewalks with the drink, cross, then walk back. Safety on the streets would be a concern. In the event of an accident, I don't think these carts would keep occupants safe since they don't provide much, if any, protection. If there were to be an accident with another vehicle or stationary object, such as a telephone pole or street sign, serious injury or ejection could occur. Golf carts don't come equipped with airbags or seat belts, so the lack of safety features suggests that they are meant for recreation areas where there aren't any large vehicles competing for the same space. Furthermore, they are light and can flip easily, which raises more concerns about upper torso and head injuries. I haven't seen people wearing head or upper body protection in carts. So as a result, and someone could so as a result, someone could suffer greatly from a bad injury, even at low speeds. I've seen kids driving these around, and I don't think it's a good idea to have inexperienced drivers operating the carts around larger vehicles as well. I realize the top speed of the carts is around 15 miles an hour. That's going pretty fast considering there's no protection in the case of an accident or flip. An accident going 15 miles an hour in a car is much more survivable in the case of an accident. Another thing to consider is insurance. If there's an accident and it's the fault of the person driving a golf cart, how would insurance cover property or injury to the affected party? Also, what if the golf cart operator is under the age of 16 and doesn't have auto insurance? Golf carts take up the same amount of a parking spot than a car. Unless there's coordination with another person in a golf cart, there could be two carts possibly squeezed in a spot at the same time, but it seems unlikely. Also, I don't think it's a good idea to section off areas and parking lots for them if there's not enough demand, and I don't think it would be wise use of real estate for the city or a retailer. And I've got the next speaker, please sign. I've done my three minutes, sorry. All right. Next we have uh, Robert Heider, uh, was received on the second this morning. My name is Robert Heider. I am a Webster Groves resident and support golf carts in our community. I believe the proposed safety features are appropriate, but request the removal of the permitting requirement. Spot ticketing in lieu of permitting would be a valid option, given the relatively low quantity of golf carts, limited seasons they can be driven, and ease of law enforcement to view missing features. Lastly, I request exceptions for elderly, disabled, and those with special needs. Additionally, I have compiled a list of 147 golf cart supporters in favor of limiting the restrictions. First, safety has been the biggest factor according with the proposed ordinance or associated with the proposed ordinance. I am a proponent of safety, but I'm concerned we may be making a mountain out of a molehill. Below is the data comparing golf cart injuries to other approved eco-friendly transportation. Golf carts account for 13,000 injuries per year versus bicycles, which cause 467,000 injuries a year. Golf carts account for 13,000 injuries a year versus electric scooters, which cause 27,700 injuries a year. A fatality is 85 times more likely to occur on a bicycle than a golf cart, and a fatality is nearly twice as likely on an electric scooter. Furthermore, in March 2019, Webster Groves set a precedent by approving the use of electric scooters on public streets in anticipation of rideshare scooter companies coming to town. Yet the CDC and Consumer Product Safety Commission data shows that golf carts are twice as safe. Nothing is risk-free, but on a comparative basis, golf carts are a very safe alternative. Applying permit requirements on golf carts based on false safety concerns would be unjustified. Additionally, golf carts are legalized in 47 states and provide benefits to the community, including environmental benefits, a social form of transportation, promote community, provide a safe form of senior transportation. Golf carts also benefit local businesses as golf carters are more likely to visit local restaurants, opposed to evaluating options which may be outside of Webster Groves if driving the car. Webster Grove stands to generate greater sales tax and keep the community close. Please don't overregulate golf carts based on the promise of safety, while the data shows golf carts are a very safe alternative. Sincerely, Robert Heider. Taking a drink. Sorry. All right, uh, next is from Michelle Heider. Dear, uh, that was received on the second. Dear Mayor Welch, Council members Alexander Arnold Bliss, Franklin Richardson, and Smith, City Manager Peoples, City Clerk Nakazono, Chief Curtis, and Captain Perks. My name is Michelle Heider, and I am a resident of Webster Groves and support golf carts in our community without permitting and excess, reg uh, excess regulations. The use of golf carts in our community provides many benefits, including environmental benefits, eco friendly, low speed, social form of transportation 
sense of neighborliness and community, safe form of transport for seniors, take less space to park, benefit local restaurants and businesses, and family fun in our community. Golf carts are a safe transportation alternative, and I ask that you approve the use without permitting and excess regulations. <clears throat> All right, next we have uh, Christine Sire uh, received today. My name is Christine Sire. I am a resident of Webster Gross for over 70 years. I do not own a golf cart, but I support the use of them in our community. I have never had an issue with any of them and quite frankly, seldom come across them at all. Has anyone really had any issues with them? You are all talking like they're rampant, causing accidents, etc. That is certainly not the case. <clears throat> the pros definitely outweigh the negatives. I honestly don't see any negatives of these eco-friendly vehicles. They add to the charm of our community. Please approve the use of them without permitting and excess regulation. Thank you for the, all that the council does for our city. John Lewis uh, received today. My name is John Lewis. I am a resident of Webster Groves and support golf carts in our community without permitting and excess regulations. We have vacation property in a golf cart community and it is amazing what it does for the community. People stop and talk to their neighbors. Kids actually go for rides with their parents. This is a great opportunity to drive more business to local shops and restaurants. I understand that some people are citing safety concerns and I think that is completely exaggerated. Owning a golf cart and experiencing a golf cart community myself, I can tell you that they are safe and fun and I think it would change Webster for the better. Peter Sadlow uh, received today. Good day city of Webster Groves. <clears throat> I want to accept, express my interest in maintaining that golf carts be legal in Webster Groves. I have worked with the city council in the town of Dauphin Island to make them legal there with much success. We found that when people are driving in golf carts, they often wave to each other and often stopped even to talk to strangers. This doesn't typically happen in a car. Our golf carts in Webster Groves, our golf cart, and there are only four HP and all electric. For pennies of electricity, we can run all of our errands, take the kids to soccer and have dinner out. There's almost no maintenance. We don't produce the heat, noise, air pollution or oil pollution of a 300 H uh, horsepower vehicle. If Webster promotes carts, you will see a dramatic increase in sales tax revenue within the city. I only shop and eat within two miles of my house with the cart. The local shops will love having more of them. On Dauphin Island, we have zero reported accidents involving golf carts and have found that they are more likely to pick up trash on the roadways through our Going Green project. All golf carters typically carry a bag to put word trash in. Our town has never been cleaner. Webster Groves is perfectly suited for carts versus a Kirkwood or Brentwood. This is an instance where less regulation is better. There's not a problem to be fixed. Okay. And then we have um, a form letter that was received uh, from today from the following, David Austin, Justin Bolzenius, Nancy and Rob Eviker, Kate Haneke, Weston Harding, Alex Hill, Lindsay Roberts, Willie Jim Rush IV, and Stephanie Wideman. The letter reads as follows, and the individual letters will be exhibits to the February 2nd meeting minutes. I'm a resident of Webster Groves and support golf carts in our community without permitting and excess regulations. I believe the safety concerns are being exaggerated. Additionally, golf carts provide substantial benefits, including environmental benefits, eco-friendly, low speed, social form of transportation, sense of neighborliness and community, safe form of transport for seniors, take less space to park, benefit local restaurants and businesses. Golf carts are a safe transportation alternative, provide many benefits, and I ask that you approve the use without permitting and ex excess regulations. And then the remaining ones contain additional comments within the form letter. This is from Aaron Greco, received today. Uh, I'm adding my name to this because it will help with the traffic issues pertaining to speeding and cut through traffic. As you know, I've been pushing for decreasing speed limits and additional stop signs. Golf carts will slow speeding down. I also believe this will encourage the increased number of walkers in our walking community and help support our local restaurants. My name is Erin Grieco. I am a resident of Webster Groves and support golf carts in our community without permitting and excess regulation. The rest of this is the form letter. All right. Uh, Jenna Bartels uh, 
receive today. My name is Jenna Bartels and I am a resident of Webster Groves residing in South Webster close to Edgar Road Elementary. I fully support golf carts in our community with, without permitting and access regulations. I believe the safety concerns are being exaggerated as we currently have many golf carts already in our community, including South Webster, and I have yet to see any negative consequences. Additionally, golf carts provide su substantial benefits, including eco-friendly, low speed, social form of transportation, sense of neighborliness, community, safe form of transport, take less space to park, benefit local restaurants and businesses. Golf carts are a safe transportation alternative, provide many benefits, and I ask that you approve this use without permitting and excess regulations. Erin Parton received today. My name is Erin Parton. My wife and I have been residents of Webster Groves with our two daughters since 2013. I wanted to take a few minutes to explain why we own a golf cart and support golf carts in our community. Oh. Uh, I am not sure of the past comments regarding safety and regulations, but believe the safety concerns can be exaggerated. We purchased a golf cart in 2018 and then enjoyed many safe rides around the neighborhood in downtown Webster and neighboring Kirkwood. While I believe that it is necessary to ensure the safety of all residents in our city. I don't support any form of perm permit taxation and other excessive regulations on the use of golf carts in Webster Groves. Additionally, golf carts will provide many benefits, including environmentally friendly, low speed, fun form of transportation, sense of neighborliness and community, take less space to park, benefit local restaurants and businesses. As our city continues to bring in younger families, and grows around the downtown area, golf carts are a safe transportation alternative to cars, trucks, and SUVs. They provide many benefits, and I ask that you approve the use without permitting and excess regulations. Bradley Rolf received today. Uh, my name is Bradley. I'm a resident of Webster Groves and support golf carts in our community without permits and excess regulations. You no doubt have received a number of comments, but I implore you in considering them to weigh empirical evidence of any argument rather than what if. I believe the safety concerns are being exaggerated. Additionally, golf carts provide substantial benefits, including environmental benefits, low speed, social form of transportation, sense of neighborliness and community, safe form of transport for seniors, take less space to park, benefit local restaurants and businesses. On top of it all, they're cool and fun. That may seem silly, but the Hill and Soulard are some of the most vibrant and desirable neighborhoods in the city and all see wide use of golf carts. Golf carts are a safe transportation alternative, provide many benefits, and I ask that you approve the use without permitting and excess regulations. Kelly Bender received today. My name is Kelly Bender. I am a resident of Webster Groves and support golf carts in our community without permitting and excess regulations. I believe the safety concerns are far less than have been suggested and the benefits outweigh the reach, the risk. Some of the benefits include friendly for the environment with no carbon emissions, Increased business to our beloved local restaurants and shops, fosters a sense of community, safe form of transport for seniors. I believe golf carts are a fun and safe transportation alternative to help us enjoy the community. I have spoken with my neighbors and they seem to be in, in agreement that golf carts are good for our community. I ask that you approve the use without permitting and excess regulations. And then Holly Rodman received today. My name is Holly Rodman. I, have a, I am a resident of Webster Groves and support golf carts in our community without permitting and excess regulations. In addition to the items below, my handicapped brother loves nothing more than to go for a golf cart ride on a Sunday afternoon. I would love for him to be able to do this at my home in Webster Groves. I also believe this encourages local spending and supporting small businesses and community feel. I believe the safety concerns are being exaggerated. Additionally, golf carts provide substantial benefits, including environmental benefits, eco-friendly, low speed, social form of transportation, sense of neighborliness community, safe form of transport for seniors, take less space to park, benefit local restaurants and businesses. Golf carts are a safe transportation alternative, provide many benefits, and I ask that you approve the use without permitting and excess regulations. All right, now we will ask for anyone who wants to speak to raise their hand. Let's see, let me go over to attendees. I am, oh, there's a hand up. It's from Robert Heider. Um, did I believe we had a letter from him? Mm -hmm. So he is already entered into the public record. Right. Hmm? Uh, there was a letter, yes. Okay. okay. That's the only hand I see up. I'm gonna scoot away. All right, then we will be able to move on this evening.
Um, there is no new business or no, uh, it, <laughs> from, from those of us who are here, we'll move on to number four new business, which is Bill 9141. Uh, and uh, Council Member Franklin, would you call for the first and second reading, please? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to call for the first and second reading of Bill number 9141. Second. Bill 9141, first and second, excuse me, first reading. In ordinance of the city of Webster Groves, Missouri, amending chapter 60, the traffic code, article one, section 60.010, definitions, and article 10, miscellaneous regulations, section 60.635, use of a motorized play vehicles, roller skates, coasters, and similar devices, and adding a new section, 60.636, operating personal assistance, mobility devices, golf carts, and low speed vehicles, definitions, prohibitions, penalty, and, made, and matters related thereto. Are there any questions or issues before we have the second reading? I just had a question. I think this is a really good ordinance. Um, I think that it encompasses a lot of the stuff that we've discussed. Um, I, I had one question, particularly about the licensing. Um, do, Currently in the state of Missouri, do uh, are golf carts required to be licensed? No. All right. So, and, go ahead, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Neil. The only license that we're making reference to is a driver's license for the purpose of operation. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we're not talking about license plate in the vehicle, but we are requiring a permit sticker. So for the things that we are setting out that would be allowable, there would be a one-time visit to the police department who would then look to see that all of the things that are in the ordinance are actually on the vehicle itself. If they are, we will take a sticker, put it in a, uh, in a, in a prominent place on the vehicle, and that's a one-time deal. So uh, there's no uh, recertification or relicensing or repermitting? No. Right. Unless it were transferred to another person. So again, if, if for some reason it were sold, it belonged to somebody else, then, then you would you would do it again, but uh, otherwise it would not be redone. Would there be a cost associated with the permit? Well, that would that's up to you. I didn't put that in an ordinance one way or another. Um, I mean, typical there would typically there would be some minimal fee, whether it's five dollars or ten dollars, just to cover the costs of what's going on. And it does involve, you know, again, there's going to be somebody that's going to have to spend some time going out and looking at the vehicle to make sure that you're checking off the list to make sure everything's there. But there's nothing in the ordinance as it sits that would do that. Thank you for all your hard work on this, Neil. And whoever. Well, thank you. But I will tell you that the chief had, had a large role in it uh, and, and you, communicated. And, and I will tell you that I couldn't have done it without Jennifer and Katie, because we brought in a whole lot of other things uh, to make sure that uh, we were being consistent throughout the code. Thank you. For, for the people who are listening, would it be, a, I think it'd be appropriate to list what are those safety requirements that that have to be there. And Neil, you're in a better position to remember all of them than I am from just reading through. Sure, so one, so in, in, the, in the proposed ordinance itself in the area called allowable operations, which is subsection C, in paragraph two of subsection C, it says low speed vehicles, golf carts, or similar devices may be operated upon the roads posted or regulated at 25 miles per hour or less may cross roads posted or regulated at 30 miles per hour or more, but cannot be operated on sidewalks. The operator of a low speed vehicle, golf court or similar device must be insured, have a valid driver's license and the vehicle must be licensed with the state of Missouri if state law requires a license. And it must be equipped with front and rear lights. Operators and passengers must wear a properly adjusted and fastened safety belt that meets the Federal National Highway Transportation and Safety Act requirements. And a permit sticker must be prominently displayed. And then of course the operation of the vehicles has to be in compliance with both uh, local ordinance and state law. Emerson, you had a question, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, just want a couple of clarif clarifications, Neil. When you said uh, must be insured, is that liability insurance specifically for the golf cart? Yes. So again, what you're doing there is you're protecting individuals who might be injured in the golf cart, uh, whether they've caused the injury or whether they're just injured. You want to make sure that they have it, it, what I would call the mandatory minimum liability policies in Missouri. Okay. And when you mentioned front and rear lights, does that mean turn signals as well? 
I haven't placed that in here. Um, I was concerned more about visibility itself. I would indicate, I would suggest that perhaps hand signals might be enough, but that's up to you. We could certainly add that in there that you would have to be able to signal uh, with appropriate lights. Okay. And I, I do have one other provision I want us to consider is that uh, that golf, golf carts remain to the right when there is more than one lane. And that's a good point. And frankly, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Emerson, because uh, one of the things that we would have is a situation where if we have two lanes uh, that are going in, in, in the same direction, uh, requiring the golf cart to remain in the right lane, unless making a turn, uh, would, would, would be a good thing, because otherwise it, it could impede traffic flow. Yeah. Do we have, my last, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Leo. I was just going to ask, do we have any two lane roads that are uh, operate at 25 miles an hour or less? We have, the, again, I'm not sure about Lockwood. Lockwood is 25 miles an hour, but it's, it depends on if you're counting the parking lane or not. So there are times during the day, of course, where the parking lane is, is an operable lane uh, because parking is prohibited. Um, again, indicating some language that would require the carts to stay to the right, I think would, it's just as a matter of safety would be a good thing. Yeah. And then I, only other thing I want to make sure that we take in consideration is what impact that would be during a regular school year for 16 year olds to drive a golf cart to school and they're taking up additional parking spaces in the community. And, and that's a question for council. I will tell you that, again, I've made no provision for that because it is a parking question. But, and again, I, I, the thing that I don't know is how many golf carts there are out there. You know, I mean, are we really in a situation where we're talking about the potential for being flooded with golf carts? It, it seems to me uh, that there's there are economic questions that are involved here. But um, well, if I was a parent of a student going to the high school and they was a driving age, and instead of buying them an automobile, I just buy them a golf cart. Well, then there's going to have to be some provision for parking if that happens. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the school district already pushes, siphons off the parking on us anyways. We have problems associated with it. So yeah, it's just going to compound it then. How would it compound it? If, if students are walking and they can drive the golf cart, they want a place to park it. So you're saying that those that aren't no, or that are currently not driving would start driving a golf cart? I'm just saying if I was a parent with a high school student and I wanted to provide my child with transportation, instead of spending money on a car, an automobile, I would just purchase them a golf cart to get back and forth to school. Uh, are there any requirements for a windshield? Was that eliminated or is that there? I did not include that in there. I looked over a number of different uh, um, uh, ordinances that talked about these golf carts and I didn't find any that required windshields. Again, I can add that back in um, as a safety measure. I don't think that's, you know, again, you might want it as a comfort measure because you're going to get wet if you don't. But, you know, again, other than that, uh, I didn't see anything that required it. I can add that back in at your direction. Okay. Is there anything, Dale, uh, Curtis, Dale, you're on here that you would like to add to this discussion? The only thing I really could add is that um, if it were to pass, I certainly wouldn't have an issue with us going actually to a resident rather than, have, than having to come into the police department to inspect it. There's no reason we can't do that for the residents. They wouldn't have to come into the city hall. So they wouldn't have to drive through those illegal speeding streets, right? <laughs> you would go to them. All right. right. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about any changes that need to be made. Uh, whether we want to amend this now uh, or we want to put this off, probably we want to amend it. And I think Emerson has talked about um, the requirement that the golf carts stay to the right. Um, Chief, when, there's more, when there's more than one lane, yes. Chief and Neil, um, 
help us out with that, with, with making some language here for someone to put an amendment in here. Um, I, I, I would do that in paragraph two, again, that I was referencing. That's under the section called allowable operations. Uh, actually, I could do it under paragraph three, because there it says the operation of these vehicles while on public roads shall be in compliance with and subject to the state statutes and ordinances of the city of Webster Groves. I can put a provision in there basically that would indicate that the, the vehicles would stay to the right so as to not impede traffic. It's easy language um, and I can clean that up and I would put it in that third paragraph. Okay, then someone needs to make an amendment before we have the second reading to that, to that if you wanna get this done tonight. Mayor, I make a motion that we make an amendment to the uh, law to put a provision in the, for golf course to remain to the right where there are more than one lane. All right, and that would be amending section C number three. Yes, ma'am. Correct. Okay, is there a second on that? No seconds. Yeah, I'll second that. Okay, so now we have an amendment on the floor. Is there any discussion of that amendment? Then Katie, let's call for the vote on that amendment. Sure. Uh, Council Member Arnold? Yes. Council Member Bliss? Yes. Council Member Franklin? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Yes. Council Member Richardson? Yes. Mayor Welch? Yes. Okay, so now we've, we've put one amendment in there. Is there any other amendment that needs to occur, Emerson? Is there something else that you see we need to change? No, I think uh, Neil answered all my questions about the insurance and about the turn lights. So since they have front and rear headlights, that'll be sufficient um, security for the lights. Okay. All right. Can we call then for the, can we have the second reading as amended? Bill 9141, second reading as amended. In ordinance of the city of Webster Groves, Missouri, amending chapter 60, the traffic code, article one, section 60.010 definitions and article 10, miscellaneous regulations, section 60.635, use of motorized play vehicles, roller skates, coasters, and similar devices. And adding a new section 60.636, operating personal assistive, assistive mobility devices, golf carts, and low speed vehicles, definitions, prohibitions, penalty, and matters related thereto. All right. Um... Let's move on to bill number 9142. Uh, Councilwoman Richardson, could you call for the first and second reading, please? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to call for the first and second reading of bill number 9142. Um, that's it. Second. Bill 9142, first reading. In ordinance, repealing the restrictions established with the approval of ordinance 3705 while maintaining the establishment of 34 single family residential lots and matters related thereto. Uh, Mara, you're on here. Did you want to make a, a, a statement or a presentation? Or are you here for questions? Here for questions. All right. So does anyone have a question about 9142? If not, let's do the second reading, Neil. Bill 9142, second reading. In ordinance, repealing the restrictions established with the approval of ordinance 3705 while maintaining the establishment of 34 single family residential lots and matters related thereto. All right, so we'll move on to the consent agenda. Does anyone want to remove anything from the consent agenda? If not, could we call for the approval of the consent agenda? Emerson, would you do that, please? Yes, Mayor, I'd like to call for the approval of the consent agenda. Second. Council Member Bliss? Yes. Council Member Franklin? Yes. Council Member Smith? Yes. Council Member Alexander? Yes. Council Member Richardson? Yes. Mayor Welsh? Yes. Council Member Arnold? Yes. 
All right, this evening we've, um, we've appointed uh, John Burse as uh, an alternate member to the Board of Adjustment, Michael Rose to the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, we've uh, moved uh, PJ Pupolo from an alternate member of the Board of Adjustment to a regular member. And we have reappointed Patrick Murphy to the Arts Commission. And now uh, we need to call for an executive closed session. I think so Councilwoman Arnold is up. That's yes, Councilwoman Arnold. <laughs> job so, always. Somebody had to fill in for Frank once he left us. <laughs> so this is, I assume, uh, attorney client privilege communication, real estate negotiated contract? Yes, ma'am. OK. Yes, Mayor, I'd like to call for an executive closed session regarding attorney client privilege communications, Missouri statute 610.021, open paren one, close paren. Number two, real estate, Missouri statute 610.021, open paren two, close paren. And number four, negotiated contract, Missouri statute 610.021, open paren 12, close paren. Second. Council member Franklin? Yes. Council member Smith? Yes. Council member Alexander? Yes. Council member Richardson? Yes. Mayor Welsh? Yes. Council member Arnold? Yes. Council member Bliss? Yes. All right, this, um, this meeting will be, um, we will shut this meeting down. And for those of you who still have your hand raised, uh, we ask you to do that at remarks of visitors. That's the time in which we take comments. So when you come back and join us at our next meeting, um, that's what we'll ask you to do is, is to make your comments at the remarks, the time that we allow through remarks of visitors. All right, so um, thank you all for being here tonight. We have a lot of participants. Uh, we appreciate this and we hope you'll join us at our next meeting in two weeks. And for now, We'll, we'll be back, council, with executive closed session. Give yourselves a five-minute break, okay? Mm -hmm.